So we tried the, the content app, we tried a meet new people app called Vibe. We thought there was a big problem. Dating or? Make new friends, but it naturally tends towards dating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Let's call we're like, spade spade. <laughs> okay, this is a dating app. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, the business model in dating in India, it does not work. What works is Shadi, right? So people will pay for Shadi intros, but not pay for dating. dating and in, in the US, it's different yeah. completely. You know, it's a big market. It's a hundred billion dollar a year market, by the way. Shadi. Wedding market. Wedding market. Oh, the overall market. Okay, overall. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge market. In my first cohort, we had 60 students. 12 got married to each other. The ultimate matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey. I'm not going to spend time introducing him. I'm sure you all got the memo. And uh, you would have done your research. They would have probably gone to Wikipedia. Oh probably boy. stalked you. <laughs> probably stalked you on, in on Instagram. Instagram is your is your Instagram open? It is. It is. It is. And my Twitter too, but I don't post as much. You don't post yeah. as much. Okay. As I used to. So I'm not going to spend time on the introductions. You guys already know who he is. Uh, so we'll jump right into the questions. But I want to start with the audience. Okay. Does anyone have any questions they'd like me to ask him, uh, or they want anything to be addressed? Start there. Yeah. Uh, what kind of framework does uh, Kevin use while running hype? Oh, wow. Kind of you uh, started with a heavy question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. All right, what else? We'll, we'll just take some feelers. Yeah. Go ahead, guys. Don't make me cold call. <laughs> GST impact on Russia. GST yeah. impact on Russia. Okay, great that's. Question. So now we went from deep to controversial. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What was your strategy in order to create the network effect? Oh, great. Technical now. Very great. How does the pivot happen from messaging to gaming? That's the best question. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. What else, guys? No hype for stickers first. So how did that start? Like so Very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I still use your stickers to talk. Where? <laughs> <laughs> the app doesn't exist anymore, man. Well, did you download a pack or? No, we, I can have the stickers and use on the seminar to talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's yeah. something you learned about your product today. <laughs> we'll put some stickers for a bit, but we've taken them off. Maybe you still have some on your phone. The stickers are fantastic. Trying when I use Nokia Lumia. All right, we can use some details. Was that an Android phone or a S60 phone? My so Okay, same thing. All right, okay. Wow. All right, so you've got a sense of, you know, what we're looking for from this yeah. session. And I think we can get started. You said some question was a really good question, which was about the conversion from messaging to gaming. Yeah. So let's, yeah. let's start with that. Let's start with that. Let's start what, with What that. happened there? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, we launched Hike Messenger in 2012, December 2013. Sorry, how many of you used Hike? Oh, wow. Wow. All right, yeah. that's your target audience right here. And uh, we had you know, launched it and we'd gone from, you know, long story short, launched to 35 million, you know, active users on a monthly basis, about 14, 15 million daily active users in about four, four and a half years. And the big hypothesis that we had, which I don't think we sort of talked about a lot publicly is, you know, back then data was very expensive. Smartphones were had just arrived on the scene. We had 2G data, not 4G data. And it was very expensive and complicated to use the internet on your, on your smartphone. And so the big question we had was, could we simplify the go-to-market to the internet via messaging? Could we sort of use messaging and convert it to a gateway or a highway to the internet? And that's exactly what we did for four years, four and a half, five years. Uh, we launched hike to SMS, stickers, hidden mode, a bunch of stuff on the, the platform. And then we also converted Hike Messenger into a super app. Yeah. We had, you know, services, content, games, payments, and that worked like a charm for about four and a half, five years. The challenge we faced was when 4G became super cheap and smartphones became super cheap, the market completely changed. And we were very excited, by the way, first when 4G came and, and the smartphones became cheap because the the internet market in India was stuck at about 55, 60 million because the, it was so complicated mm. to use. And we had 35 million monthly active users. We had half the penetration of the online market. So I guess it's also no surprise that so many of you used Hike Messenger. But when, when, when the cheap smartphones in 4G arrived, at first we were like, oh, good, because the market can finally expand and we can grow into it. 
and something strange happened mm. instead of us seeing that sort of massive growth of the product we saw our metrics start to tilt mm. the other way not this way but this way and we said okay you know small aberrations etc cetera, etc cetera, and so on and so forth and that didn't stop so we started digging and digging and we made some you know changes in the product and we were getting ready for 4G too because our platform was very text heavy very text and photos heavy in a 4G world it was different it was much more photos and videos heavy mm. so we also had to evolve our platform we you know made some modifications to the timeline we took some risk but what we ended up realizing was no matter what we did we were actually in trouble <laughs> we were in trouble because suddenly when 4g becomes so cheap i mean it's 2 dollars for 30 gigs a month mm -hmm. and when your smartphones at you know 8 9000 rupees are very good they're dual core and quad core and god knows what else you get you know today you don't need a super app mm -hmm. the smartphone itself becomes the super app and there was a big challenge before this to download an application install data was very expensive storage was very very scarce all that went away in 9 months yeah and so the super app aspect of our business was becoming slowly obsolete and i still remember you know 2017 2018 we had just come off raising 175 million dollars from tencent foxconn hike was worth over a billion dollars and suddenly one year after that we were faced with this dilemma <laughs> and so the super app was no longer as relevant and so we saw our user base start to churn off especially those guys who came mostly for the super app and we took some risks with the product because we had to change and innovate evolve, yeah. those risks didn't pay off i think we just accelerated our decline because and then we realized if all we have is a social messaging product and india is not closed off like china you know in china the market is closed off so you can build your own tencent and alibaba and so on and so forth india was completely open oh. which meant that if you're building a social only product you're competing against the world yeah instagram tiktok facebook everything you name it and uh, you know it, there's a lot of indians abroad too so india's network is not just india it's global mm -hmm. so the question you'd ask was you know damn it do we have to fight the global battle yeah and that's a tough one because i think you asked that question about ne building networks messaging and social is a network game it is not a product game no matter how much innovation you have on the product if the network's not there it does not matter you're on whatsapp because you're you know everyone's there. your family in whatsapp yeah and so we realized that oh my god we don't have a shot at winning this battle we may have to accept that we've lost this battle mm. and uh, you know we tried a bunch of stuff tried to salvage the product launched a separate you know messaging app around stickers etc cetera, etc cetera. and i realized in 2018 that i think we need to was shut. that a tough decision was like emotionally hard or it was just too clear in front of you it took us some time to come to that decision because of course naturally you want to make this work there's so much sunk cost etc mm -hmm. etc but when the time came to make the decision actually it was one of the easiest ones because ultimately if you're a startup you know momentum is everything mm. and when you've seen four years of let's say you know nothing but this and then you see a year and a half of this is painful yeah and so we had to get ourselves back into a position where we had momentum we tried everything we could interesting and we realized this is a global game we would have to raise 3 4 500 million dollars to go global and even then success was not guaranteed and we were a very consumer focused product we were not a b2b focused product so we didn't do the the slack opportunity and so on and so forth that was not us mm -hmm. on our dna and so I remember deciding in 2019 we had to shut the super app down and transition as many people off to this app called Hike Sticker Chat which is a messaging only app focused on stickers. And by the way we had 7 8 million customers using the app every yeah. month. Still mm. down from 35, right? I think close to 10. And we experimented and we tried and there's no there's no playbook to pivot a business. you know there's a playbook to grow the business there's all those kind of, there's no playbook to pivot a business and what we figured out was the playbook is you have to first of all make sure you have enough runway mm. and so the first thing that i done was we had a team of 350 400 people i had to cut that team down to like 120 and we had two offices we had bangalore we had delhi we had to shut the entire bangalore office down 
and come back to our core sort of team. And that got the, the burn of the company down tremendously, which shut all these forward looking projects, et cetera, as well, and said, okay, time for us to go turn the ship. The ship has now become a bit of a speedboat. Yeah. Let's go sort of turn it now. And turning means what? You have to hit shots on target, but they can't be random shots. They have to be calculated. Mm -hmm. So we had to figure out first, what were we really good at? What were we super passionate about second? Third is, um, where would the business model be clear enough and you know social companies messaging companies are this unique beast where you don't need to focus on building the business model until you have the network covered yeah and then you figure it out hmm. and but so you don't want to do the same thing again the next time second time no it's it's not just that but i think those businesses are unique right like in 2016 we launched the payments platform as a way to start generating revenue in the platform we never saw could See that through, that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we had one opportunity like that. Uh, you know, we had content, gaming, and a bunch of stuff in the super app. So naturally, we took that learning into all these new products we were launching. The one we never made public, by the way, was an app called Super. Super. Yeah, S O O P E R. Okay. And it was a content app focused on you know what effectively share chat has become today. Mm -hmm. And you know, the crazy thing is that got a lot of traction very, very fast. But we saw the content that was getting posted on the platform and we're like, we can't wake up in the morning and build junk. Yeah, it's sleazy. You know, and not just sleazy, but good morning, good night. Are you okay? <laughs> okay right? So, so, and the mission with Hike, the vision was, let's go bring in the online. Mm -hmm. So we need something big. Something more meaty. Meaty and something bigger than ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I also remember thinking that uh, there's no way <laughs> the business model is going to work around this because ads don't work in India. It's a very Western sort of, you know, business model focused market. And also, you know, I was doing a lot of reflecting and digging as to what works and what doesn't work. And I also realized that if you look at the top companies in the world by market cap, and today they're huge, but if you look at them, they tend to have one thing in common. All the large companies? All the large companies. Let's say top 50 or top 100 in the world. Top 1000 as well, mm -hmm. right? 99% of them had a good to strong business model from day one. There is this thing that happened in the last 10, 20 years after the internet came. Where things become so cheap to build that companies get funded very early without the business model being figured out. Mm -hmm. Or you can... Figure out the business model where you can operate at negative gross margins, mm -hmm. like Uber and so on and so forth. Yeah. But most companies from very early on had the business model figured out. Pre-internet age. Even in the internet age, if you look at Google as well, there's a myth about Google. Mm -hmm. They were printing money from a very early, early point. Very early point. I guess Facebook, perhaps. Facebook is the only one. Only one, yeah. Only one. And Snapchat too. Social companies. Yeah. Right? Not top 50, so it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's still big. Social companies. Yeah. Exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft, same. Apple, same. Oh, yeah. yeah. NVIDIA, same. So this time when we did it, let's go also find a genre category yeah. that has a decent business model. It's like a dhanda, like there's something that you sell, something that people buy. There's yeah, a margin and, and there and people make. Absolutely. And by the way, that makes your life so easy. Because if you're building a product that is a network product and it's not yet making money, you can launch anything to improve retention sure, yeah. <laughs> and complicate the product. But when there's a core loop, yeah. It's a lot more focused and a lot easier, yeah. as we've seen now, realized. Like Nandas are easier to execute. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's what I keep telling you guys. So, I know you asked this question. I'm getting to the point, by the way. Uh, we, we launched Super. We got traction. We had half a million daily active users. Sleazy videos. Not working. Not sleazy, actually, <laughs> but just, you know, absolute trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know what you mean. <laughs> but, but... How many of you use share chat? <laughs> It's well, okay. You can say, you can say. Share chat <laughs> has its purpose, by the way. There's, there's a pocket of the, the platform that's actually quite good. But there's um, also that Chingari and Moj. Yeah, yeah, and by the way, this is, this is uh, it's a lot of fun content, but we didn't see ourselves building this. Mm -hmm. It's entertainment in some ways. It's okay, yeah. right? There's nothing wrong with that. But also, by the way, you can build a very large build business selling junk. Coca-Cola is a $100 billion company. It sells freaking sugar water. McDonald's, I don't know how big it is, $70, $80 billion, it sells absolute junk. So you can build a business selling junk, okay, but right. business itself is of no interest, right? And call me idealistic. We wanted to have a decent to positive impact on the world as well. Right, okay. 
and you know you when you're born like you don't you don't create the air you breathe you know we speak a language not invented by us so you're constantly taking mm-hmm. and if you're a builder you have a chance to maybe put something back in the world and hopefully that's neutral to positive mm-hmm. right so we tried the, the content app we tried a meet new people app called vibe we thought there was a big problem dating in, uh, dating or make new friends but it naturally tends towards dating yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called like speed is speed okay this is a dating app yeah. <laughs> and by the way the business model in dating in india it does not work what works is shaadi right so people will pay for shaadi intros but will not pay for dating, dating and in, in the us it's different yeah. completely i think this audience is probably different i'm guessing <laughs> yeah and we don't represent mass india, india yeah. i guess in some ways right so so we said okay no <laughs> Then we had one more product we launched. So why didn't you do shadi? We were not the best people suited to build that product. <laughs> so, and uh, you know, it's a big market. It's a hundred billion dollar a year market, by the way. Shadi market, wedding market. Oh, the overall market. Okay, overall, yeah, it's yeah. a huge market. So, and yeah. by the way, some company is going to go and crack that, right? Yeah. Uh, but um, it might be a college. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in my, you know, so in our oh, first, oh, you oh. see what I mean? Yeah. I, see. I mean, like. Yeah, yeah. Because is it secretly it, a dating? I think so. Like sometimes, <laughs> in my first cohort, we had sixty students. Twelve got married to each other. The ultimate matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> that should be. A, yeah. Okay. I should. That I should is charge, your slogan. Yeah. I should charge fees for that. <laughs> yeah. That's a. That's a. That's yeah, a good. That's a good line. Come get educated, get married. <laughs> Full stack service. Yeah. So the the third product we had was the the gaming product. <laughs> Uh, and in you know, a long story short we launched it and we had this idea which was gaming had become a huge suddenly in a couple of years market is 2 300 million in and our customers 4G had become cheap smartphones are fantastic and people are guzzling entertainment a lot of it and the question we had was okay entertainment's working but what's the biggest problem in the market biggest problem is this is a low income population 90 to 95% of india earns less than 300 dollars a month So could we take gaming, which is super fun, and also convert that into a new source of economic opportunity for the mass? And that was the inception of Rush. And when we launched it, we got product market fit, and we have scaled it so fast because I think we were very clear about the the problem statement, and also we benefited tremendously from the fact that we had learned how to build networks. Mm-hmm. This is also a network. When you come on the platform, it's a PVP. network it's not a friend network it's a player versus player network mm-hmm. you have to walk in the genre is it's free to play win to earn and pay to participate in bigger tournaments so we have 6 million players in the platform about 2 to 1/2 million people pay because they're confident in their skills we have 15 games in the platform and rush today is now doing over half a billion dollars of gross revenue a year this, this is, is people betting the total amount of money total amount of input in the system on, on the system Uh, as a matter of fact, it might be 600 million as of Jan. The platform wow. is growing very fast, and this is in 34, 35 months from launch. And uh, just for context, uh, a Dream Eleven would be how much? Dream Eleven does fantasy, mm-hmm. which is a very different category. Okay. But I think there were probably six, seven billion. Oh, okay. They're, right. they're pretty big. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And then that's billion. cricket. Yeah, that's cricket. ten years yeah, yeah. cricket. Yeah. Uh, very different genre. We don't do fantasy. We do casual games like Golf Hero, Archery, a little bit of Ludo, etc., etc. All the games that India loves that are simple to play that can work in a competitive format. Right. So it's not gambling then. No, no, no. Gambling is banned in India. I mean, yeah. I mean, but yeah, people yeah. figure out a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would think that Ludo is gambling, right? In a sense. Ludo itself, by the way, is a game of chance. So we have a very different and modified version of Ludo. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had to change the game, you know, quite meaningfully. But I would say betting and gambling is sort of wagering on an outcome you have no influence on. Hmm. you know how much will he score in the match mm-hmm. whereas what we do is you have to compete and win so you're betting on your own self your skill to okay. beat the other player so you've converted the ludo game into a game of skill by changing yeah. the rules of absolutely that charam and a you know 50 other games on the platform we're launching we hope to launch let me say that we are on fps so, game on the platform we'll correct. see where that goes and uh, i think what we you know after those tries what we stumbled upon was a humongous market product market fit scale and fantastic unit economics mm-hmm. we were going to be profitable by the way as of december last month but it is not meant to be because we had this gst ruling so that's been pushed back 12 15 months 
in the process, by the way, I had to recap the entire company. Mm. You know what recap means? Effectively, I was worth $1.4 billion at one point in time. I had to reset the value of the business to... Mm -hmm. And that was a tricky one because you had to have but you these had conversations. Money, money in the bank from before? Yeah, so we had money in the bank that we used mm. to pivot, navigate, build the first version of the product. Mm. There's a story about that I'll tell someday as well. We had to recap the entire business effectively because the old business had no value. You know, fortunately we were very, our relationship with our investors is great because we were transparent mm -hmm. every step of the way. And recap the business, then raised by the way, $20 million since then, mm -hmm. effectively a, as a fresh, a down, down round, fresh, fresh brand new yeah. company, like Pref walked off, you know, you know, no valuation. And now the company building is again. building again. And the reason I decided to do that is because one, we had a lot of investment. We spent a lot of money building hike. So we had accumulated these tax credits in the business. Okay. <laughs> and we didn't want to let them go. Yeah, it would course. have been extremely foolish. Yeah. And we're using a lot of them today, by the way. Mm -hmm. We didn't foresee so, this. So how long are you not going to pay tax now? No, we are paying tax, but we have these credits this that credit. we can use. And the other thing was, I knew if hike failed, I was screwed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In a market like India, especially, you know, with the you know spotlight I've had on me from an early age, I was absolutely screwed. So I had to make this work. work yeah, I know. And so long story short, that's how we pivoted to, you know, gaming. And we were fortunate to find also a vision we can be attached to. And you know, the market I think is 100, 200 million customers. We have three, four million customers right now. So that's where we are. Well, yeah. Understood. So do you think that, I know there's this app called Pixie Infinity or Axie Infinity yeah, in Axie Southeast Infinity. Asia, right? And people actually make their livelihood playing that game. Yeah. Do you think that's a possibility through Rush? I think it's a possibility. We see it happening on the platform where people supplement their income in certain pockets with Rush. Now that's interesting. Uh, can this become a platform where people just do this over time? I think it has the potential, but there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Even Axie Infinity was not a sustainable economic model. We saw it go up very fast and crash. Oh, it crashed? Or, oh, oh, yeah, oh, okay. Big, big, big way. Because when, you're, when you have a token and you have a token involved in a game economy, you're not, it's a very different beast. Mm. You're like a mini nation online. And if you're printing your tokens to infinity, you'll have hyperinflation. Hmm. We all know which what happens, they were. Which they had, yeah. right? So, so they had to rebuild, et cetera, et cetera, which, are the, which they're doing right now. Very, very, very big potential. Yeah. Because gaming may not just be a source of economic opportunity, but customers can become owners in the platforms they help create. And that's yeah, also can you, part can of you like explain to us in, in more sort of dumb language? how this entire token system works and how you can actually become the owners of the platform you're playing on. Yeah, I mean, it's actually quite simple, which is all the value, let's say Facebook, is built on what? You, me, us, all our data. We are the product. I mean, we're effectively the, the core value. Hmm. So when they're making billions of dollars of revenue off my data, where is my cut? It's because customers don't own their data. It's all owned by Facebook. When you upload a photo on Instagram, they own it, by the way, right? So if you change that and allow customers to own things, then all the value ascribed to things you own will come to you. Hmm. The blockchain effectively is a toolkit, is a new kind of a database that lets you own things in the virtual world. Hmm. And thus can make them non-fungible of sorts, right? So that's it. Can you launch an, a token, fungible or non-fungible, that actually enables you to own a part of the platform and thus participate in the economic upside as the platform grows in value. Now extend this, by the way, in a much, much bigger way. Let's say Rush launched a token and let's say the company is worth, you know, a, a billion dollars, mm -hmm. right? Hypothetically speaking. And if customers own 10% of that, there's a hundred million dollars of value. Created for the people. For the people. Now let's scale that to the Indian economy. Let's say the Indian economy reaches $5 trillion in, let's say, a couple of years, right? And let's say a trillion dollars of that came from the internet economy. And let's say the government was super bold and said, all internet companies must allocate 10% of their token supply to all their customers. Mm -hmm. Your, the Indian consumers will own 10% of the value created in the internet space. It's a hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That could change everything. That could change the market. Do we country. have any examples of this having happened in a, in a pragmatic, in a practical way anywhere? 
I think th there are a couple of early examples of people like actually trying things out, but they're also early, so they're experimenting, trying, et cetera, et cetera. We hope to be part of that ecosystem contributing towards this. There are many projects, by the way, out there. Uh, Ethereum's the biggest one. If you look at Ethereum, it is a, it is a decentralized visa. That's what Ethereum is. And you can actually become a you know, staker, you can become a, a participant in the network, get paid for transactions happening on your node. You guys have already done the blockchain course, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Anyway, so I mean, that this world is coming, right? Sooner or later. So, you know, you spoke about net positive impact on the world. And so my question is then, is a gaming company, just by virtue of all its externality, really a net positive in the world? Can we convert it to a net positive, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with entertainment hmm. at all. You know, we're human beings, we need some play <laughs> from time to time. There's nothing wrong with that. The question is, can you convert that play also into something more? Mm. That's our goal. And uh, we've got a long road ahead to figure out exactly what this looks like. And I guarantee you, what Rush looks like today will be different to what Rush looks like in three, four years from now. Yeah. How many of you actually have earned like significant amount of money playing games? Anyone who's a gamer here? You want to share your experience? like? What games do you guys play in? Yeah, go ahead. It's okay, just shut up. Yeah, I, I used to play PUBG. Okay. And we used to play for the eSports <coughs> and then participated in local and there were national level competitions. So there were private competition as well as there are public competition which were hosted by the PUBG themselves. So I didn't participate in that, but a lot of private competition came here, like a good amount of money in that college day. Yeah, yeah, and by the way, just to add to that, he's not the only one. I mean, you may be the few people here, yeah, yeah. but that is a proper career in the West. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's not miss the, the corner. Oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Kevin, it's Pradeep. Um, I just wanted to know what if, um, you know, our customers get addicted and start losing money and create a negative social impact? And we want to build something meaningful and want uh, to increase the economy, but what is the opposite? Yeah, it's a great point. It's actually the one thing that keeps me up at night, right? And as a result of which, what we do is we have things like smart play in the application where if you have a small losing streak, we, we push you back. So you take a break, you're losing, calm down, go take a break, come back. Mm -hmm. Today, the default timer is an hour. But we are going to let the user choose between an hour to like, let's say 15 hours, 20 hours, a day, two days. Because ultimately it's also in not just the user's best interest, it's also in our best interest. Because if a user comes to the platform and let's say plays, you know, a game and loses, they're not going to have a very good relationship with the platform. You know, I think very favorably about the platform. So we're incentivized to push you back <laughs> and say, relax, your emotions are running high. You want to make some money back. Don't do it, come back tomorrow and play again. I mean, but it is a zero sum game, right? For somebody to win, somebody else has to lose. Right? Y yes. Unless the token comes in, of course. Not just that, but like we have 5 million, actually now 6 million players on the platform, out of which only 2.5 million people deposit cash. Okay, so for the rest, it's entertainment. It's entertainment, but also, you know, right now we fund that free behavior on the platform, right? And number two is, Extend that idea and th start thinking of the Rush Gaming Universe as a virtual nation. Now, a nation has a bunch of things. It has you know, access to the nation, which is in the form of a passport or a visa. Then based on that access, you have a type of citizen or type of person, a citizen or a tourist. Mm -hmm. So think of these three people as tourists on our platform. And the citizen is someone who actually deposits more than 10 rupees in the platform. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because when you deposit money, the whole platform starts to open up. Mm -hmm. You don't open up the entire experience to a free player. It's not right. Once you have that done, then these citizens and tourists will trade amongst each other, forming a GDP for mm. the economy. And in pay case, tax while they earn. And in our case, our GDP is a, is a half a billion dollars of you know, gross value. Mm. As a nation, we tax. We tax so we can invest back in the infrastructure to educate customers, et cetera, et cetera. Then the nation has a currency and the nation has scarce assets. Hmm. And the token will be our currency, and the NFTs when we launch them will become our scarce assets. And the currency is a way to trade locally inside hmm. the, the, the nation. There's a reason why India has a rupee, US has the dollar. If you have rupees today and you go to the US, you'll convert the 
rupee to a dollar sure. becomes far more utility, mm -hmm. right? That becomes a token. And ultimately, the one that we're still figuring out is what is the equivalent of scarce assets mm -hmm. inside the platform? Because mm -hmm. in the world today, <laughs> scarce assets are not of our creation, necessarily speaking. Natural resources. Natural resources and so on and so forth. But in the online world, you create them. So the, and that economy competes with the currency economy as well. So that's one. Second is, is it a zero sum? To some extent it is, but an economy is zero sum. Right? The global economy could be, but a no, country's economy, country's there's economy. a net positive, let's say trade deficit or the, so a the, trade surplus. A, an economy inside the walls of a country, let's assume that for a second, hmm. someone creates a, uh, a good or service and sells that to somebody else in return gets money. Right? Now I can create a service which can have no from no natural resource and sell that to you. You have to pay me. The only way I can make money is if you give me your money. Mm -hmm. So economies tend to be net net, you know, zero, but the way an economy grows is you need FDI. Mm, correct. So what is the equivalent of FDI? FDI in yeah. Rush. It's a really good question, right? And we're working on that. Okay. I mean, it's the, a really good question. Yeah. The token makes a lot of sense. I see how someone then gets value yeah. from playing beyond the zero sum. Yeah. But uh, the FDI, yes. Beyond just usually. Yeah, think about it. Why can't we have people coming and sponsoring gameplay in the platform? Yeah. Okay. That's FDI. There you go. It doesn't have to be complicated. Mm. Right? And we are incentivized to figure this out exactly because of all the stuff we're talking about. So if I right? know that so, a bunch of 23 year olds are playing this game, I, as a college, can come and, let's say, sponsor a game. And that's advertising for me. Okay, understood. Yeah, also... So advertising I mean, is one way to bring money from outside. I think it always is. And it could be more than that. Like brands that adhere to, let's say, the young first-time jobbers can come and sponsor tournaments. Right? Why does like the prize have to be like real money? It can be a pair of very fancy headphones. Yeah, sure. That's FDI. So bringing sources of income from outside becomes critically important to scale this to 100 million users. Hmm. Because the genre of gaming is also new. This is very new. It's the last four or five years where this genre has sort of popped up. So, and by the way, if you have FDI, not just from, so there's the Rush economy, which sits, let's say in the India economy, then India sits in the world. So, I mean, ultimately, the ultimate, ultimate FDI is FDI into Rush, not just from India, yeah, but course. from the world. Because yeah. they also, they have a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and they will do a lot more sponsorships and, do you have users currently outside of India? No, no, Rush is completely Indian. Completely Indian for now. Yeah, and by the way, we saw this in Axie Infinity. Some people will buy the NFTs and delegate them to players. Yeah, rent it out to players. Rent it out to players. Yeah. These people actually had a lot of money, bought the expensive NFTs and said, if you play with my NFT, let's you and I share 50-50 revenue. Mm. Now, the cost to the player is zero. Yeah. That's an FDI. Yeah, yeah. This is what the token enables. It's right. incredible. It's so we are just scratching the surface of this stuff. So just, I mean, I'm sure you collect a lot of data, right? Which which state plays the most amount of games? Uttar Pradesh. You <laughs> and uh, yeah, Bihar, Rush is very popular in the middle north belt of India, right? Bihar yes, is next. So you're like so. Mr. Modi. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're not making those jokes today, clearly. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, and what are some other interesting metrics that have come out of, about India in general from your experience, both of hike and this? I mean, a majority of our user base is actually tier two and below. 25% tier one, the rest is all tier two and below. And language is tough for a lot of these people. Mm. So we had to sort of port, of course, the app completely in, in Hindi. But more than that, we, can, we also see that people don't read. I think there are two things. One is people don't read. And second is people don't necessarily know how to read. Mm. So also in your user experience, you've got to figure out how to reduce the amount of text. Yeah, and increase the amount of voice inside the user experience, something again that's oh, working. Wow. Like, why shouldn't the app talk to you? Why mm. should you have to read anything? Mm. Or why shouldn't you walk in and say, Mere ko ye karna hai? Mm. and the app takes care of it. This is the LLMs and the AI models that we're working on behind the scenes okay. to further see, you know, simplify the experience and so on and so forth. Okay. So, yeah. You know, there's someone who works in my, in my home and whenever she's not working, which is perhaps she's working 20% of the day, 80%, she's just waiting around, she's playing games. Mm. Isn't that true for like a lot of, right? And, and is that a lot of the audience? People who just have a lot of time on their hands and just want to kill time? Yeah, so it's actually uh, first year college. Okay, first year of college. Yeah, we see first, second year of college, right? <laughs> to, <laughs> to like 27, 28. Okay. That's the age group. The, there are, there are college-going students, first-time jobbers, and also older people 
who, for example, have a shop and yeah. have, a, have multiple shops, have a small business, but have a lot of time on their yeah. hands. No? And which is the most popular game of all the 15 ones that are there? The, the popular games are Karam, okay. Snakes and Ladders, our version. Of course. Okay. And then our version of Ludo, which okay. is what we call Speed Ludo. Speed Ludo. Speed Ludo. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's a five minute game. Five minutes. Five minutes. And all the games on the platform are less than five minutes because of the bite size behavior, right? We also have a version called Tez Ludo, which is two and a half minutes. And that's <laughs> becoming very popular very fast. I don't know why. <laughs> you need even like a real version of a Ludo, like less than 60 seconds. Yeah, no, I don't no, think so. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll try it out one day. We'll see what happens. Got it. So gaming is one thing. So you definitely want to go deeper into gaming. You're saying there's a hundred million possible users. Well, first of all, I mean, look, we've come here after a pivot, right? right? So the fact that we have a business that's working, it's a great place to be, yeah. right? Number one. <laughs> and second is, oh, okay, we can scale this. Yeah. Let's go scale this, right? And eventually, you know, Hike is, was always meant to be a conduit to a lot more. Yeah. I would love to get this, this coming to a place where we can start generating a profit and printing cash. Yeah. If we can do that, then we can start thinking about other things. And ultimately, that's the dream. Yeah. Would you say that's been one of the major learnings because of the pivot to focus and, and to, to really get it to cash flow positive? Um, yeah, look, you know, we, when we built Hike, we are, I think, amongst the few companies that have seen the market in an easy state, hard state, easy state, hard state. So in, mm -hmm. the, in the beginning of Hike, when we raised, you know, capital from Tiger and Tencent and so on and so forth, we were growing like a rocket, but the market also was good, mm -hmm. capital markets. So while the, the Tiger investment was, I would say, relatively easier, the Tencent one was very, very difficult because the markets were not in a good place. In 2016, interest rates were cranked up and I spoke to 50 people. We closed only two people, Tencent mm -hmm. and Foxconn. So we saw how tough it was to raise capital, but because we were growing and investing, we kept sort of you know, moving forward. But after we decided to pivot the company, the fear of running out of money is the biggest lesson of all. Because if we didn't figure out our shit, right, mm -hmm. and start find a, a product that actually had a business model, nobody was going to fund this company. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Like, pivots are rare, especially in India. Yeah. And so, so we had to hustle. <laughs> yeah. So you, you mentioned something very interesting that if you fail as an entrepreneur, then a lot of, you know, eyeballs on you and... and, and you know, there'll be, there'll be some uh, implication of that. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that, you know, what you meant about that and, and how you feel. Yeah, it's a great position. question. It's a great question. So I think ultimately, um, you know, your relationship to failure changes over time as you go through things, you know, experiences and so on and so forth. And I feel like if anybody fails who's had enough success in was prominent at a certain period of time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think in a market like India, this is probably also older, four, five, from four, five years ago. I felt like my life would have been reworn back 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because the credibility loss with that in a market like India, especially having the spotlight on my head, would have been not just normal, it would have been amplified. Yeah, of course. Right? If you do well, you do really well. And if you do badly, you do yeah, really if, well. Yeah, if you do well, you would have had a tremendous amount of luck. If you do badly, it's all on you. So. <laughs> and so, and that was not necessarily a driving factor, but I was very aware of it. Because ultimately, what am I chasing after? What are we all chasing after? It's freedom. Mm -hmm. Right? To do what you really want to go do. Mm -hmm. And so I realized if hike didn't work out, I would set my targets for ultimate freedom back by a long way. But the funny thing also is, by the way, success only comes from dealing well with failure. It's paradoxical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so failure is like our friend. It's not a yeah, no. bad thing. It's, it's your friend. And the key thing is to, you know, bet the company, uh, sorry, uh, make big bets without betting the company. Because when you, you know, have a shot on target, if it doesn't work out, you can try again. A lot of people make bet the company bets. Mm -hmm. You should never do that. You always need a second, third try because you don't necessarily know if what you're going to launch first in the market is going to work or not. Mm -hmm. 
And in software companies and internet companies, because code is relatively to atoms, mm -hmm. bits to atoms is a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. You're incentivized to try a lot. And so our culture is very experimental. We have a hypothesis for everything. And we encourage people to try thoughtfully. And if you were thoughtful about the experiment and you failed, it's a good thing. Correct. We'll pat you on the back. And, and does it become even harder because, I mean, just implicitly media, people would compare like, you know, you with your dad and the yeah. family. Does that amplify things? I don't think, I think maybe when I was younger, I'll be honest with you. I, I was very naive and foolish. And I think I still am, right? Mm. To a large degree. So I, these things didn't bother me. Mm. I was so hell-bent on building something. And I was so obsessed with just building something great. Mm. It wasn't until we had to pivot the company when I became aware. Because the media comes after you, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, oh, okay. They care. <laughs> <laughs> they care. There's this world out there that you know, we have to sort of you know, think about. And I think we also had so much success for the first four and a half, five years that Things were just going mm. and we were so busy building, right? Um, but from all of that stuff, I realized also ultimately, you know, society is set up to judge failure. Just think about it. And I think Indian society more than other society. Mm -hmm. And as a result of which, most people tend to live a life of quiet desperation. How many of you relate with that? Again? It still comes because it's yeah. no desperation. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's life. It's mm. human society. It's human beings. Most people live a life of quiet desperation. Mm. Why? Because if I, if I fail, what happens? Mm. Right? And the, the toolkit to come over that, overcome that, is at least the framework that I have is the following, which is, you know, as human beings, we have this weird need for certainty. Mm -hmm. It has to work. Or if I do something, you know, there's a very big desire for certainty. Mm -hmm. But once you realize certainty doesn't exist, mm -hmm. things start to change. It doesn't exist. There's no right. guarantee you and me walk out and won't be hit by a car. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. certainty doesn't exist, then what? And you start to realize, oh, it's not certain uncertain, it's possible or not possible. Hmm. And just humor me for like two minutes, right? Let's say you and I walked out of the, the campus yeah. and we talked about this example of getting hit by a car, right? Hmm. And so there's, there are two possibilities here. We can both get hit by a car, but the other, other possibility is we don't get hit by a car. Hmm. There are two possibilities. Now, which one will happen? What's the probability of this possibility happening? And what's the probability of this possibility happening? It's not certain. Mm. They're both possible. One is more probable mm. than the next. It's more probable that we don't get hit by a car because <laughs> mm. we're inside the, the DLF compound. So there are no certainties in life, but there are possibilities and probabilities. So if, you're, if your life is on a certain timeline, mm. And let's say something happens and the timeline goes awry. Mm -hmm. It goes bad. And let's say if you want to change it, you have to pause mm. and realize that the choices you are making is leading you down this path. So just pause for a second and ask yourself, wait, what are all the possibilities? And there are an infinite number, by the way. Mm -hmm. What are all the, where do you want to go, right? And what are all the possibilities? And what's the probability of those possibilities? in terms of which one's going to get you to where you want to go. Hmm. And once your thinking starts working like this, everything changes. Everything is a possibility in motion. Hmm. So you become comfortable with ambiguity, you become, you become comfortable with uncertainty. Yeah, you realize uncertainty doesn't exist. Hmm. Possibilities and probabilities exist. So everything is a stream of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's a way to think about it. But on that note, I want to open it up to the audience. <laughs> um, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. I know we started with a few in the beginning. We can come back to, yeah, go ahead. So we all know we have some 6 million users right now. I'm curious to know how you get first 5,000, 10,000 users on the platform. How do you make those 5,000 downloads in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, fortunately we live 
in a time where you have, if you're building a mobile app, the Play Store and Apple I, I, iOS Store actually acted as, as a fantastic distribution mechanism. So having the app on the store itself will get some organic discovery, but you may get a couple of hundred users like that. What you gotta do is figure out where your customers are and actually go to them and talk to them about your product and show them your product and get that first customer. And I think, you know, Paul Graham from Y Combinator has a saying, which is do things that don't scale. It is so true. Like to start with, you need a hundred customers who absolutely love your product, even a customer who loves your product. And if you have a customer who loves your product, what is he or she going to do? Tell people. So it actually, weirdly enough, starts off with building a fantastic product that's solving a real problem in the market that your customers absolutely love. If you do that, you will get to your first 100,000 customers. And but, then, but on day one, your product wouldn't be as good, right? I mean, it'll be like an MVP. It'll be very new. How do you still get that stickiness? But the MVP doesn't need to be bad. And, you know, the other point is, and I've made this mistake so many times, which is you tend to ship too much into a first version. When you're building a first version, this, this fear of ye chalega nahi, ye bhi dalgo, ye bhi dalgo, ye bhi dalgo. And what you end up doing is you end up convoluting the MVP because now you have four things to test, not one. You have to cut, 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 simplify, take one core loop and try. Short on target. And by the way, expect the first one not to work. The MVP is a learning dart that you throw. And then, you know, if you think in possibilities and probabilities, the rest will take care of itself. Yes. What's your product? What are you building? Um, so I'm basically creating a one-on-one -on -one career mentorship platform. What we have realized is when students are in 11th and 12th standard, they're super confused on which college to get into. Mm. Now, how do they decide on which college to get into? They talk to their family, friends, counselor. But the problem is the person who is giving advice has actually not been to the college that they're giving advice. So for us, let's say there's a student in 12th standard who wants to do VBA from top colleges of the country. We connect him to the students who are currently studying there. Now these students get on a one-on-one -on -one call with these people and explain everything about their college. How to get admission, how the entrepreneurship culture. Should you come to my college or not? So that this person who's actually spending 15 lakhs, 20 lakh of rupees across four years, spend it on the college that is good for them. And so where will you get your first 5,000 customers? Uh, I love it, yeah. So we have a, a crack the B2B deal with one of the college. I'll prefer not to quote them right now. I'll just be recording. Um, so we will be helping, yeah, so we'll be helping the aspirants uh, connect with their current students so that they actually get to know what the college is all about. So this is how we are getting our first 1,000 customers and we are planning to... Very smart. Yeah, that's a nice growth hack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to invest, by the way, I don't know if you invested or... I don't, but <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm excited about education. Not as much as you, but I yeah. am. And so, I mean, send it over. I'd love to have a look. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, same question again. I, we understood that the kind of frameworks that you use in your personal life on how to deal with uncertainty. But I would have some insights on how you make decisions like in your company. Like what kind of personal frameworks that you use like uh, during decision making? Like which directions to take, what to invest in, what not to invest in. Sorry. Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll answer the broad one first, and then I'll answer the details ones next. So when you're a CEO of a company, your mind has to move like a radar across a couple of things. At least this is the way I, you know, I, I made it up myself, right? And um, there are six, seven, eight things that you have to keep a track of all the time. One is what is your vision? And the vision includes the purpose of the company and also like your dream state five-year plan, your dream, whatever it could be. It could be actually the most craziest thing you want to go build, right? And it's very important to articulate that because that binds the team together. It's always better if the teams are working on something bigger than all of ourselves. When you wake up in the morning, then you have something beyond yourself to work on. That's very, very important. So on a regular basis, I'm always asking, is our vision clear? Do people know about it, etc.? Second is, once you have your vision, you need a set of principles, articulate your values on what you value. And we have something called the hike code, 
which is our nine codes, which is a value system. One of them, for example, is be curious and keep learning. And we actually give feedback to employees on this. It's part of their performance reviews and so on and so forth. These principles are really, really important. And by the way, early on in your career and journey, you'll have a set of principles that will evolve as you figure yourself out. Third is, once you have these principles, based on these principles, go find people to work with. They must align to your principles. If you find people who don't align to your principles, you'll be fighting internally. It'll take a lot of energy and time away from you. I've done that, by the way. It's not fun. Once you have these people, then you have to go build the product, uh, which includes strategy, distribution, unit economics, and so on and so forth. And once you have the product, then you need just enough process to streamline all of the above. And then you need to also find ways to communicate all of the above regularly. And then you need capital to amplify all of the above. So vision, principles, people, product, process, communication, capital. This is how I run the company. And my mind is on all of these things at a certain cadence all the time. So for example, my mind is on the product 24-7. Um, my mind is on capital, I would say, every six months. My mind is on the vision every three or six months. My mind is on people all the time. So this framework allows you to sort of touch all the dimensions of your company on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. What are you building? Uh, uh, we are building something uh, which has a wide space in the market. Like for example, uh, the formal wear around women. Uh, the, the, the market is slightly fragmented when it comes to certain offerings that have ethnic motifs on the Western wear. For example, you can imagine a Western uh, blazer or a suit which uh, has a chicken curry on it. So that kind of, uh, you know, apparel is absent in the market, or if it is, even if it is present, the like select designers are providing those, you know, apparel ways and uh, they cost around 25, 30 k, 30 k is pretty high. Mm -hmm. So you want to provide something that's, uh, you know, in the mass premium range. So Very cool. what are some of the core values that you would have for your company? I, I think like my partners and I like decided on two core values like that, that for sure. Like first of all, we won't exploit any, any, uh, you know, person in the whole supply chain process. Mm -hmm. Like right from the artisans to the to the cloth factor to the people <coughs> delivering our product, and secondly, we'll uh, stick to the sustainability practices. Like for example, we won't be using any plastic in the whole manufacturing process. For example, like most of the products that you Western wear that we see in the market right now, they are a blend of uh, like cotton and polyester. So we we'll either keep it 100% silk or 100% cotton or 100% wood, or, or, or a blend of natural products rather than any polyester or any nano. You should use that in your marketing, by the way. Yeah, 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 that's pretty cool. Yeah. Is, is that a fair application of core values framework? Yeah, so that's your values for your product and your business. You also have to have values for people, both sides. I was curious, what do you look for in the candidates that are hired at Hype? Yeah, so to simplify it, you know, the people that I absolutely love are those who have a way of delivering at the highest quality in a record amount of time. Our culture is very intense, right? So they deliver the highest quality in a record amount of time and they make it look easy. No matter how young you are or how senior you are in the company, this is the one trait that I look for. And if you dig deeper and ask what makes a person like that, the trait that you know, comes to mind is they are radically responsible. They have this insane ownership mindset for their emotions, their work, everything. There is no ounce of victimization in their mindset. They will never blame. They take full responsibility. And I also notice that people who take like full responsibility tend to be very resourceful, really resourceful and driven. They find ways around problems somehow. And I think it's because they think deeply about stuff. They can do some second order thinking and first principle thinking, and they also move very, very fast. This is the kind of person we, we love to hire. How do you yeah. test for that in an interview, let's say? How many interviews did you have? Nine. Nine? Oh, okay. Is it nine? Nine calls Jesus. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so one is we, we look for experience in your, your past mm -hmm. and, and not just work, in your life. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, you'll see me ask you about your childhood mm -hmm. and some sports teams, etc., etc. right? We look for situations in your life that you've gone through. What's your favorite interview question? If I tell you, then like everyone's going to know. You can change it. <laughs> it's okay. My favorite interview question actually is, 
is different. It's a problem solving interview question. Okay, let's do it. And I'm, I'm just thinking <laughs> if I want to give it to you. <laughs> You, okay, you, fine. You, I'll have to change. You, you change can this. change it. It's okay. Yeah. But so, you know, people can bullshit you in interviews, right? Very easily. And often, if you ask them about their work experience as well, people tend to claim things they do that they don't necessarily do, That's right? Great. So then, you know, I love putting people on the spot and testing how they think about things, the world, you know, and so on and so forth. So, my favorite interview question is Can you tell me how many. Um, extraterrestrial civilizations exist in our universe that can communicate with us on earth no you have to answer now <laughs> how many how many alien civilizations exist that could communicate with us okay and walk me through your thinking and your interview hanger at the poor guy on the spot man it's okay thoda soch ke batana it's okay <laughs> <laughs> We're on the spot. Beyond me at the moment. Um, it's okay. I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, he's just messing with you. <laughs> just messing with you. Don't worry. And you know the reason I love this question is because it shows you the assumptions people make. Right. And people make some really, you know, lousy. Uh, you assumptions. have to email them with the answers. <laughs> don't forget. That. So yeah, go ahead. You want to answer the question? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Don. Sensor pleasure to have you here. So I've always wondered this. So um, you come from a family background, which is uh, one of the most prominent business around in India. So I've always wondered, don't you feel tempted to you know leverage that, go back to that? Like what made you choose something which is completely different? You have you have carved a own path of yours, which is very very different from telecom or tech sector. Mm. So what makes you go back and start something of your own and not take up something which is so huge and established already? Secondly, like. Don't you feel like leveraging that network? So, for example, say Airtel is there. Airtel has a very, very huge network, right? Distribution is already set. So, does Rush, or do you always feel, do you ever feel that Rush can somehow do some collaboration with Airtel and make use of that leverage and uh, of the network already? So, that's my question. Don't you feel tempted? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good question. Thanks for asking. So, I have to set some context, right? I, can, I tend to confuse a lot of people with my life choices and what I do. I'm sure this is similar for you too, right, in some ways. And uh, you know, Airtel is not a family business, which is very unusual for India, by the way. Airtel is not a family business. It is a professionally run institution, more like a, a Google or a Apple or a, to some extent Facebook and so on and so forth, right? So it's not a family run business, it's an institution and a very large institution, you know, serving the country and the world. So in the same way, you know, Bill Gates' kids will not come and run Microsoft one day. There was never the expectation for me and my twin brother, I have one, and older sister too. Never. This was never meant to be ours. Now, it's a very Western way of thinking, but it is the way it is, right? So that's number one. Number two is as a result of this, we were raised to be independent. And by the way, I was born in 1987. Airlo was founded in 1995. There's no Airlo when I was born. For the first seven, eight years, we lived a very normal life, by the way, right? It wasn't until 2003 or four, I think, when my father's wealth actually came. We were 17, 18, all grown up, going to college, right? So we were also raised to be independent. And we lived a pretty normal life. And uh, so that was the thinking. And uh, honestly, thank God for that, because it kind of gave me the space to figure out me, my own life, my own story in this short time we have, you know, we have on this planet. So that's one. Number two is distribution, etc. Well, these are independent companies. So they have a, you know, arm's length relationship. And also, you know, Airtel in the online world uh, has some distribution, but not a lot. Because in the online world, what is the touch point of a telecom company that sells a SIM card? It's their app. It's the Airtel app that you sort of reach out from. And that has some distribution, um, but not a lot. And so, you know, if there was something to use as well, there's not in some ways, right? Yeah. I would send an SMS to all Airtel users. <laughs> SMSs don't convert. They don't convert. I mean, I have so much spam no, in my inbox joke. right now. I don't even see it anymore, right? So I guess, unfortunately, we have <laughs> nothing to use. <laughs> it's really quite interesting that 
while I was searching for this, uh, while I was searching for you know Russian on, I actually came up with something which quite ties with the FDI and the B two B space, the twenty five percent from tier one and the one, and that happens to be the fact that what if uh, it's just something that I was thinking sure, sure. myself uh, is that what if we use historical events, teaching as a matter of fact, as a gaming stop. All right, mm. wherein probably the schools come in, fund us, so that it becomes the FBI. How do I mean it? So let's say Alexander's expedition. All right, he starts all the way from Greece and then comes all the way to Indus, where he loses. We make this as the game, wherein he is fighting one game, uh, one war, then the then the other war, wherein people are actually fighting the war, whether that be player versus player, otherwise. And that ends up becoming a entire thing in itself, a chapter of world history in itself. All right, that becomes what is something that you know the schools can utilize to teach that. And specifically, this will be applicable only in tier one cities because, of course, you don't have your government schools which do all of this. So it's only the high five schools, schools with a lot of resources and all, which will be interested in such kind of an idea, which will. Not only revolutionize um, education, it will change the edtech space, but it will also mainstream gaming in the tier one cities. Actually, not the case, not just for us, but for most of these, uh, except for fantasy and all of that, most of these games, which are almost completely played in the tier two and tier three cities. So this is what I actually think. Yeah, I think the the takeaway is you know gaming as a way to educate, which I think is brilliant, by the way, and. We think very often of launching a game on also on our platform. Small games like, you know, mathematics, learn English, play, compete, sort of earn on those platforms too. And those are the kind of games that would work for the the mass market. But yeah, gaming is a fantastic way of engaging a young brain and educating. Absolutely. So exactly where I was actually thinking that if we are using, let's say we end up using AR and uh, you know we use the virtual space, that entire thing. If we make it an immersive experience for students, all right, then we have the potential to change certain subjects which are absolutely boring. Say history, mm. nobody wants to read that <laughs> until you want to become a PhD in history. Mm. I guess ninety percent of here are not interested in history at all, and therefore that as a story, all of us. Okay, I'm from. So let's do this. Right? You crystallize the idea. Yeah. You send it. But we'll move on to the next question for them. Yeah, I think. Well, I'll just say one point, which is, if you are really passionate about that, yeah. then there are times in our history when platform shifts begin. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to be building on one of them. When the iPhone launched, I was one of the first developers on it. This is even before Hike, right? Apple just launched the Vision Pro. It's a whole new platform, right. and so and building for a platform shift is a best way to make a lot of progress. So just keep that in mind. By the way, right? Sports tech and the gaming industry that you are in. So my idea revolves around having an offline leaderboard uh, and a platform to both interact and socialize with all the other gamers in the industry. Now my idea is more around like the offline industry, but yours is more in the online game. So my question is, would you be interested in having a like world's first online leaderboard? In which all your apps, all your games that you have, you have a ranking like from this city, the best player in this uh, game or what? So, like, would as a founder of Hype, what do you think about this idea? I think it's brilliant, and I think it's a feature inside a bigger product. And it's not a product on its own. But yeah, yeah, I know, I know that. But still, like, let's say let's commercialize all of it and then build just one product around ranking all over the world. See, rankings are inherently a very deep part of the gaming ecosystem. They drive a lot of behavior. If you look at, you know, our platform or even other games that are huge, like Clash of Clans and Clash Royale, ranking is a very common part of a gaming platform. And I would say that the natural progression, by the way, for gaming platform is it's PvP, which means you play against people you don't know. Then you know your friends get added to the platform. Then you join a clan and a tribe, which have rankings. Then you communicate with these guys. So it's a very natural progression. Of a game or a game platform, so rankings themselves is a feature inside a game. It's not a product of its own. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, hi. Thank you so much for being here, Kapil. My pleasure. 
Hi, thank you so much for your time. So my question is, we all of us know that you have a remote work culture at Hive. So how does that work? How do you motivate your employees while they're sitting with Very good question. So, and it's a, it's a really good question because remote work is new to almost everybody. So there is no playbook in the world. <laughs> You know, COVID forced us to all move remote. And by the way, I was very against remote work. But COVID forced us to go remote. And I was like, actually, this is the best thing ever. So first of all, there are pros to remote work, which is if you're in Delhi or Gurgaon or Bangalore, the traffic, the time you save not being in traffic itself is enough. <laughs> so people are motivated to stay home and sort of work and get plugged in. But if your question is, how do you run a remote you know, company? That's a good question. And I think we, amongst a few people, have figured out how to go do this. We don't plan to go back to in-person at all. We are remote first, not remote only. So we are default remote, but we have in-person cadences every three months because you have to build the relationships offline. Very, very important. But we have rituals, what we call, or systems to sort of make sure that people are coming together on a daily and weekly basis and actually having those conversations. So I'll give you a small example. We have something called the WBRs, the Weekly Business Reviews. And those meetings are, you know, five people, but there can be up to 40 observers who can watch the meeting happen. And the meeting is one document that's written in advance. You know, it's a, actually, if you come work at Hike, you'll think we're very strange, by the way, right? Because our meetings have, like Amazon, no PPTs. It's a document, you write, you comment for the first 15 minutes, then you discuss, and then there are 40 people observing all this happen. We, if we have 10 minutes towards the end of the meeting, we open it up to all the observers. They can ask their questions. These are our top performers across all levels. And that's one way we keep the company very, very united. The second one I say, and you know, Vibhor is also part of this now, is our all hands, our virtual town hall. We do one every 30 to 45 days, and we talk about everything. The metrics, the goods, the bads, the successes, the failures. We actually had one massive failure, by the way, last quarter. A feature we launched, we were banking heavily on, didn't work. Full post-mortem in front of the entire team. Then we have Q&As every two weeks on Friday where people can come ask the most difficult questions. We made it anonymous, so people ask some really difficult questions. <laughs> but it's good because it comes out in the open. And if it's on somebody's mind, if we address it, then the 20 people who are not asking that question, it gets addressed too. And uh, so these are some of the things we do to make remote first culture work. There's one there as well. Right. Uh, hello. Yeah. So, hi, my name is Anisha. So, as you said that your target audience is somewhere in 18, like first year college students to 27, 28. So, these are the crucial, you know, time of a student or any individual for their career and all. And gaming has kind of a negative uh, thing where people think that gaming is for useless people or a lot of brown parents, like I remember when yeah. in Tokyo, my brother used to play in the PUBG and my mom used to shout like anything. So like, what do you think about this opinion of people? Like, you can make a career in gaming, but that is not very accepting right now, like career. So like, what do you think about this opinion or you just don't care? <laughs> no, no, I think it's important to care what people's parents think. Um, so, do you watch movies? Right? What was the last one you saw? Animal. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't watched that yet. So, so, you know, movies is entertainment and gaming is a new interactive form of entertainment. By the way, I am a massive gamer myself. I don't find the time. But I'd rather play a game on a PS5 that has an extensive movie-like narrative than watch a movie. So it's entertainment at the end of the day. So the problem is though, I think because of its interactive nature, it's a lot more fun than watching a movie. So people can sometimes spend more time on it, right? I think that's number one. And human beings need some entertainment. Life can be all boring. I think that's important too. And for the gaming as an earning, I think um, the early signs are there, right? And I have friends, by the way, who now their full-time job is an influencer. I mean, this didn't exist 10 years ago. In the beginning, the first two, three years, I assure you, and these friends of mine tell me stories, that their parents were worried about, Tu kuch karte nahi right? But the influencers on Instagram have half a million, million followers, and they earn a decent chunk of money, by the way. So now it's very accepted. 
So now brands come and sponsor posts and so on and so forth. So I think with gaming as well, we're in that early stage where, you know, it's confusing for a lot of people because most customers and people are not sitting at the bleeding edge of technology. So it's very normal for this to happen. And I think in four or five years from now, things will be different. Yeah. By the way, I, I was in Italy last week and I met a bunch of students there um, whose parents are very accepting of their career choice in gaming. Like they're full-time gamers and I mean, like, and they're earning in millions, so parents don't really have a choice. <laughs> yeah, and you have these young kids who are YouTubers earning millions of dollars, right? There's one person who's sorry. raising a Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> in continuation with her, what I want to ask you, Kevin, is probably the oldest from here, as you have a health background also, and another small company. But I want to know from you, Kevin, um, I live with aging parents and there are a lot of senior citizens who are losing memory. And I was wondering if brush or gaming application could work for aging people in building their um, new skills again. I was wondering if you thought of something like that because I know this is how it should be very young application but I think it can work for older generations who you know, sitting at home and they have the time and if they play snakes and ladder or they play all the games, it will help build their, you know, cognitive abilities again, the memory again, the Alzheimer's, people with, you know, some dementia. I was just thinking on those lines and what you thought about it. I mean, the, the short answer is absolutely yes. And there are many companies actually that build puzzles and games for memory and skill base, you know, skill learning and so on and so forth. So they actually exist on the Play Store. And they're quite meaningful businesses too, I think. Um, so the short answer is absolutely yes. Well, it's not our target market yet. If that changes, we'll let you know. Thank you. Oh, that's you. We've communicated once before. Oh yeah, by the way, I, I used to be a very fat kid. <laughs> so I love my chocolate, and I love her chocolates. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hope you start buying again. <laughs> yeah, hi, Kavin and Swami. Uh, so I would like to know your strategy for the SPS gaming that you are talking about. So I'm a competitive gamer by a Call of Duty Mobile Soccer Division in Asia. So I resonate a lot with this mindset. So what I understand here is that uh, there's this top five percent of uh, young serious gamers who pay a lot for the skins and all. Uh, but they also have a very cult-like uh, thinking that they maybe do not want to associate them with casual gaming platform. You know, yeah, just like a Call of Duty mobile game has even been not shipped to PUBG in that way. Uh, so they need like a very reason uh, to get into the gaming, especially if it's a casual platform which is launching SPS. So how are you trying to go about it? Yes, a great question. We have two parts. One is we can build our own battle royale game. We have a early prototype internally because we have our own avatar system and so on and so forth. And the other option is, you know, you sort of strap on to the already incredible games. The, you know, the PUBGs and BGMIs, which I think have made a comeback into India because they moved their companies out of China and so on and so forth. So we're debating this internally. It will most likely be the second, which is we become the esports partner for these games. And we become the best esports partner where the, the tournaments and the biggest prizes sit on our platform. If that's the case and we can do that, and the user experience is very seamless, because the user experience can be clunky right now from one app to the other, then we think there's a massive opportunity of making this work. What do you think? Yeah, it makes sense. I actually participated in like different apps like this, which used to collaborate with uh, Call of Duty and all our championships, etc. So that's a great idea. Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one last question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You'll see why everybody's laughing. So at uh, Bento almost seven years back, first week of Feb, at a business conference uh, in Lyon. Oh, wow. I mentioned it's important to change the game. Wow. You do not go up to the competition, you go around them. And for you, I just wrote a few words. I like, want to say that. <laughs> Kevin ke vision ka magic. <laughs> Kevin ke vision ka magic. Hike me sabka craze. Wow. wow. <laughs> Kevin ke vision ka magic. Hike me sabka craze. Rush game mein hai. Pull on. Blaze. Pull on. Blaze. Dreams ko catch kare. Dreams ko catch kare. No mail. Hike's journey is like a star. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm still going, still going, wait. Kevin or Hike? Kevin or Hike? Always amazed. Always amazed. <laughs> Together, we're setting the world ablaze. The world ablaze. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. This was super interactive. And thanks, Kevin, for your time today. It was today. my pleasure. Thanks you, for having you me. You spent uh, 90 minutes with us and a lot of some very interesting learnings. And thanks for being so candid about some of the questions. Yeah, of course. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.